Our scripture reading today is Joshua chapter 7, 19 through 21. And it says, And Joshua said unto Achan, <clears throat> My son, give, I pray thee, glory to Jehovah, the God of Israel, and make confession unto him. And tell me now what thou hast done. Hide it not from me. And Achan answered Joshua and said, Of a truth I have sinned against Jehovah, the God of Israel, and thus and th- excuse me, and thus and thus I have done. When I saw among the spoil a goodly Babylonish mantle and two hundred shekels of silver and a wedge of gold of fifty shekels weight, then I coveted them and took them, and behold, they are hid in the earth in the midst of my tent and the silver under it. In Numbers chapter 32 and verse 23, Moses speaking to the tribes of Gad and Reuben after they had made the request to remain on the east side of the Jordan River and Moses had rebuked them for that request because it came across as if they were not going to help conquer the land of Canaan on the western side of the Jordan. He then, they made a promise. They said, let us build our houses, let us set up here on this side of the Jordan, and when it is time to enter into the land, we will enter and we will fight alongside our brethren. Moses responded to them that that would be fine if that's what they chose, if they did that. But he says, but if you will not do so, behold, you have sinned against the Lord, and be sure your sin will find you out. You know, so many people in our world today, and so many people, even as we look throughout the scriptures, tried to hide their sins, tried to cover their sins, and, and yet we should be assured and know for a certainty that that's not possible. And that our sins will find us out. The Hans Christian Andersen story about the princess and the pea gives us a story about how that a small irritant can create great discomfort. And such is the nature of sin. And it is the nature of sin not only for uh, the sinner, but also for those around the sinner as well. And I want us to consider a situation there in Joshua chapters 6 and 7 that clearly demonstrates that principle. Tonight we continue our series on the man, the man who covered his sins. In Joshua chapter chapter 6 and verses 16 through 19, as they were about to uh, come against the city of Jericho, a formidable fortified city, and yet God had told them that he would deliver the city to them. But as a, as, you know, because it would be the victory that God would give to them, they would not have a right to the spoils. And in verses 16 through 19, we see that God says there that the things of the city, the items within the city, with the exception of those that belonged to Rahab, he said all of those are off limits. They are banned from you taking them. And then he went on to say that those things that were made of gold, silver, iron, and bronze were holy, and they were to be brought into the treasury of the Lord. And so the city was not to be looted, it was not to be pillaged, it was to be left alone because what was there was God's. And they were banned from those things. Well, we know the story, right? They marched around the city all week, marched around it seven times on Saturday, and they blew their horns right, and the walls fell down, and they conquered this city that, you know, at first look, you're like, we're never going to be able to conquer that. And they conquer it. Right after that, they brought their army up against, in fact, they didn't even send the whole army, up against the small village of Ai. This was a weak opponent. This was somebody that, that they figured would be an easy win. This this was not going to be the kind of effort that Jericho was going to have to be. And yet they go to Ai and they are defeated soundly by the men of Ai. 
And they come back, and the people are distraught. And, and in fact, even Joshua, even Joshua's distraught. And he's like, he's asking God, why? Why have you allowed this to happen? You know, God has promised them that when you enter into the land, I will drive them before you. These are the promises that Joshua has heard, that Joshua believes. And, and yet here they are going up against Ai, and they have lost. And he asks why, and he falls down on his face before the Lord. He's not being disrespectful. He's just wondering what has happened. God tells Joshua, get up. Why are you down on your face? He said, the problem is there's sin in the camp. There's sin among the children of Israel. That someone had taken from Jericho items that were banned. Someone has sinned. And nobody knows who it is. Nobody but God. So God had them the next day gather together and they began to cast lots in a process to determine who it was that had caused this to happen. And they cast lots among the tribes and it fell on Judah. So they brought all the heads of the families through, the men through, and they cast lots in regard to the families of the tribe of Judah and the family of the Zerahites was who the lot fell upon. And then man by man in that family was brought and they cast lots again in the household of Zabdi. It landed on them. And again the process continued. And every man came and the lots were cast and it fell on a man named Achan. Joshua said, as was read just a moment ago, confess what you've done. Admit to what you've done. And he admitted there in verses 20 through 21 of Joshua chapter 7 that he had sinned against the Lord, the God of Israel. And he says, and he goes on to describe what he's done. He said, I, I, I was there. And I saw, a, I, I, I saw among the spoil a beautiful mantle from Shinar and 200 shekels of silver and a bar of gold of 50 shekels in weight. Then I coveted them. Thou shalt not covet them. There's reasons for those that, that commandment. I coveted them and took them. And behold, they are concealed in the earth inside my tent, the silver underneath that. So he goes and he goes to his tent and he digs and he puts all these things in a hole and he hides it. And so Joshua sends men to his tent and they find exactly what he said. They find these things buried underneath his tent. They take him. They take all of his possessions. They take the things that he stole from the city of Jericho. They take all of his animals. They take all of his family to a valley and they stone them to death. They piled, the Bible says, the stones up high upon them. And then they burned them. And that stone pile was left as a remembrance in regard to what secret sin can ultimately do. Most of us know that story to some degree or another. Certainly know the name Achan. But I want us to think about just a few things that we can draw from this. Number one, some sins are silent. But others scream. You know, we see in our society today sins that just scream out at us, right? People just doing things in, in our face just blatantly and openly and proclaiming very loudly that they can do whatever they want to do and their sins are loud, but there are those sins that are, are silent. Silent sins are private. They are between God and, and the sinner. Psalm 19 and verse 12, the psalmist says, Who can discern the errors? Equip me of hidden faults. Not hidden from God, but hidden from others. Psalm 90 and verse 8, he says, You have placed our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. 
See, I guess it's almost a, a mis- it's almost not right to even say secret sin, right? Because there really is no such thing. It does not exist. Because God sees all things, so nothing is secret. There is no sin that you commit or I commit or that you might do or think or go, you know, some place. No, nothing is secret. And that is what is reminded we are reminded of with Achan. But our secret sins oftentimes will find a way into the public eye, won't they? David, after committing adultery with Bathsheba, you know, well, she got pregnant. <laughs> that was about to go public, right? It was a secret sin, but it was about to go public. And so then he had her husband murdered. And he held that secret from the people for about a year before Nathan the prophet walked into his throne room and made it a very public thing. You're the man. We can also think about Ananias and Sapphira, and I'm sure that they thought that all their plotting and their planning to deceive was a secret thing, right? They did that at home. Nobody else heard. They didn't, you know, nobody else was there to hear about them planning not to give all and say that they gave all. And yet they would both fall dead at the apostles' feet because they lied to the Holy Spirit. You know, Ecclesiastes chapter 12, Solomon tells us that everything will come before God, both open and secret. And that is why he says we should fear God and keep His commandments because you're going to have to face Him one day and there is no way to escape that. You know, until revealed... Achan was the only one that understood what was going on. Remember the people were despairing. Why is this happening? Why is this happening? The only guy sitting in camp, out of probably two million people, the only guy sitting in camp that knew what was going on was Achan. He knew what he has done. And I think at that moment, he's probably thinking God, he's probably reminded in that moment that God also knew what he had done. You know, it doesn't seem like he's too surprised when it, the lot falls on him and he readily admits to what he's done because he's already known why they lost the battle at Ai and it was his fault. We also can see that some days are glorious and some days are tragic. In Joshua chapter 6, it was a glorious day when they blew that, those trumpets and they screamed and the walls fell down and they conquered the city that looked so formidable. What a glorious day. And yet just a short time after that, it was a tragic day when they were routed by the forces of the men of Ai. And the difference between those two is that when they marched around the city of Jericho, they were obeying God. And when they came up against Ai, there was sin in the camp. So the difference between a tragic day and a glorious day was sin or obedience. Which one characterizes us? Because see, there's coming a day when the Lord will appear in the air and the difference between that day being a glorious day for you, a glorious day for me, or a tragic day will be sin or obedience. You know the song, there's a great day coming, that covers it pretty well, doesn't it? It talks about the great day coming, but then the last verse talks about if there's a sad day coming for some. It's great for some, sad for others. And it's the difference between a life of sin and a life of obedience. And that'll make all the difference in the world on that day. We also see that some reasons are clear and others are confusing. All of Israel is asking why. They're confused about what is happening. And as I mentioned to you a moment ago, Achan is the only one that really seems to know. And even Joshua himself seems to be perplexed at what is going on. He would give victory. God had promised that. Why didn't he? Well, because they had disobeyed. God's promises 
to the Israelites, as we look at them in Leviticus and other places where he lists these things that he will do for them, they're always conditional. They're conditional upon you doing what I say. You're, it's conditional upon them obeying God. He wasn't going to bless them to go out there and live however they want. He was going to bless them if they lived as He commanded. And in this particular case, the conditions were not met. And while the why was not clear to many, the why was very clear in the eyes of God. Last of all, I think something we draw from this kind of at the end of the story is that some consequences of sin are personal but some consequences impact others. You know, when we talk about sins impacting other people, I can almost always, I can almost tell you that it's almost always the people we love. Those are the people we hurt with our sins. The people that love us. That's why they're hurt. Is because of their love for us. You know, a person doesn't care about me. He doesn't care whether I sin or not. But, but I hurt the people that love me. And I hurt the people I love in a life of sin. Achan was discovered and punished, but take note that his family was punished too. That his family was stoned also. And I don't know all the ins and outs of the whys to that. It is very possible since he dug the hole in their tent that they knew what he had done and they did not stand up against it. You remember when Nadab and Abihu, when they were burned up by God because they used strange fire in the tabernacle, God told Aaron, you do not mourn them. Tough command. He said, you do not mourn them because of what they've done, because they had dishonored God. And so, you know, maybe they should have revealed what he had done. And they did not. But the simple nature of sin is that it doesn't only hurt the person that commits it, it hurts people all around. Folks, we see that every day. People are killed day in and day out by drunk drivers. Wives are abused by drunken husbands. We see sin hurt people day in and day out. Violent men hurting the innocent, hurting children. The person that commits the sin is one thing, but sin has a way of hurting people that are not that person. We think about marriages and adultery. And the adultery, you know, adultery oftentimes will bring great damage upon not only the spouse, but it will bring great damage upon the children, even generationally. Sin is destructive. And it destroys so many lives. So as we think about this and we conclude tonight, know that if you're living a life of secret sin, know that your sin is known. If you hide it from me, you're not really, you don't really have much to brag about. I'm easily fooled. You can hide it from Aaron. You can hide it from Daniel. You may do that all of your life. But there's one person that you will never hide it from. Achan may have thought he could hide it. He may have thought he could bury it. You may think you can bury it under some dirt and nobody will see it. But you can't hide it from God. You cannot bury it. You cannot cover it. And it's going to be found out. Know that your sin will find you out. Know that your public sin can destroy others' lives. Know that having sin in the camp, and when we think about the camp, we're talking about the church. That if we go out there and we proclaim to be Christians, we tell people we go to the White House Church of Christ or whatever Church of Christ the person might go to, and then I go out there and I live a life of sin, and people see that, you bring reproach upon the church and you hurt the Lord's cause. Just as surely as Achan's sin 
brought pain and heartache upon the children of Israel and brought defeat. Can't tell you how many times I've sat down in Bible studies and watched Bible studies completely disintegrate because of what someone in the church did to that person somewhere else some other time. And people have blood on their hands. And people have died spiritually because of the sins that members of the Lord's church have done. So we need to understand that we can destroy others with the sin in our lives, not just us. God has said for us not to do certain things. And folks, it is absolutely no different when God tells us not to do things in in the New Testament. It is absolutely no different than when He told them do not take something from the city. And when we see God's reaction to what Achan did, then we should have a real clear understanding of how God feels when we just ignore what He says. When He says, don't do that, and we reach down and we covet it, whatever it is. James says that lust gives birth to sin, so I covet, I lust for it, and I take it. And I promise you, God is no different in His reaction than He was in that day. I love and live.